On October 28, 2004, two cave divers and longtime friends, Don Shirley and 50-year-old David Shaw, nicknamed Dave, planned a dive at Bushman's Hole. Bushman's Hole is a deep, submerged freshwater cave in the northern Cape province of South Africa, and the third deepest freshwater cave known to exist on Earth. It's located on the privately owned Mount Carmel game farm of 11,000 acres. At one point, a few miles from the farm dwellings, there is a break in the clean sweep of the land, where the earth starts to fall in on itself. The resulting crater is hundreds of feet from rim to rim and walled on one side by a sheer cliff. If one hikes down the steep, stony path on the opposite side, you come to a small swimming pool-sized basin of water. This is the entrance to Bushman's Hole. Once past a tight entrance, the cave becomes giant at a reported 393 feet long, 328 feet wide, and 927 feet deep. People who have visited say diving there is like spacewalking. Dave Shaw, an Australian, was an airways pilot based in Hong Kong with his wife, and they had two children. Dave Shaw was also an experienced and daring cave diving explorer. Unlike many other extreme cave divers, Dave didn't strive for depth alone. He planned to hit the sloping bottom at Bushman's Hole at a depth that no rebreather had ever been taken, connect a light reel of cave line to the main shot line, and then swim off to have a look around. And that's exactly what he did. On October 28, 2004, Dave Shaw dressed in a black dry suit. On his back, he carried a closed-circuit rebreather set, which, unlike traditional open-circuit scuba gear, would recycle the gas he breathed, removing the carbon dioxide he exhaled, and adding back oxygen. He carried six cylinders of gas. Dave was committed to the closed-circuit rebreather for its efficiency. The oxygen supply is automatically monitored and adjusted by a digital controller strapped to the forearm, and pretty much the only oxygen consumed is that which the diver metabolizes. Divers using traditional open-circuit scuba gear exhale huge volumes of gas into the water. The chief drawbacks to rebreathers are that they are expensive, require the diver to constantly monitor the digital controller settings, and, until Dave Shaw came along, had not been proved at great depths. Dave Shaw was convinced that rebreathers were the future of diving. In 2003, Dave had purchased a rare rebreather, developed by the U.S. Navy for deep submarine evacuation. Then Dave modified it to help the components withstand intense pressures. With his gear in place, Dave descended to a depth of about 886 feet at Bushman's Hole, breaking four different records. The records were depth on a rebreather, depth in a cave on a rebreather, depth at altitude on a rebreather, and depth running a line. The cave elevation was 5,090 feet, and the dive duration was 9 hours and 40 minutes. When Dave had hit bottom, he started exploring. While exploring the bottom of the cave, he inadvertently found the body of Dion Dreyer, a South African diver who had died in Bushman's Hole 10 years previously. Dion was a recreational scuba diver who grew up about 35 miles south of Johannesburg and loved adventure. Dion had logged about 200 dives when he was invited to join some South Africa Cave Diving Association divers at Bushman's Hole over the 1994 Christmas break. They planned to descend to 492 feet and asked Dion to dive support. He was thrilled. Two weeks before the expedition, Dion's grandfather passed away. Sitting around a barbecue with his family one night, Dion spoke and said if he had a chance of how to go out in life, he'd like to go out diving. Dion drowned on December 17, 1994, aged 20, during a practice dive. He was helping a team set up conditions for a deep technical dive scheduled to take place later that week. On the way back up, at 196 feet, 
Dion appeared to be fine, exchanging hand signals with his buddy. The group continued ascending. At 164 feet, they suddenly noticed a light below them. A quick dive recount came up one short. The team leader desperately started swimming down toward the light, but stopped when he realized the light below him was already more than 100 feet deeper, and fading fast. He decided it would be the end for him, too, if he didn't turn back. No one knows for sure what killed Dion. The best guess is deep water blackout from carbon dioxide buildup. Two weeks after the accident, Dion's father paid to bring in a small remotely operated sub used by a mining company. It found Dion's dive helmet on the floor of Bushman's cave, but there was no sign of his body. Resigning themselves to the idea that Dion would stay in the hole forever, his parents placed a commemorative plaque on a rock wall above the entry pool. But there Dave was, ten years later, staring at Dion's remains, which were stuck on the cave floor. After surfacing, Dave announced that he wanted to come back and retrieve the body, despite the exceptionally dangerous conditions. After obtaining permission to retrieve the body from Dion's parents, Dave and his friend Don Shirley returned three months later. Dave arrived in Johannesburg, six days before the dive. His first stop was at Komadi Springs, where he practiced getting a body into a bag underwater, with Don playing the part of Dion's body. At 66 feet, it went smoothly, taking Dave only a couple of minutes. A day later, he and Shirley drove to Mount Carmel, where a team of South African rebreather divers, handpicked by Don, and a police team were assembling. The dive would go off on the coming Saturday, January 8, 2005. The surface marshal was Verna Van Schack, who held the woman's world record for depth at the time. Dave was looking at a dive that would last roughly 12 hours. He would hit the water around 6 a.m. All the other divers would key off Dave's dive time and head for specific target depths either to help look after Dave or pass Dion's body to the surface. The first diver Dave would meet on the way back up was going to be Don, at 725 feet. Dave would hand the body bag over and, if things went well, Dion would be out of the water about 80 minutes after Dave's dive had started. Don had done everything in his power to minimize the risks. He planned to have 35 backup cylinders of gas in the water, enough so that he, Dave, and even some support divers could survive total rebreather failure. He arranged for a rope and sling system to be set up that could haul a diver on a stretcher up the cliffs of the hole to a recompression chamber that the police trucked in. Don had also recruited a doctor to be on hand. Dave had partnered up with South African documentary filmmaker Gordon Hiles to film the recovery of Dion. Gordon had designed an underwater camera housing for a lightweight, low-light handy cam and attached it to a climbing helmet. Dave was not used to wearing a helmet. Dave liked to carry a high-intensity light on the back of his hand, and if he needed both hands underwater, he would normally sling the light and cable around his neck so it wouldn't snag on anything. The helmet cam would make it hard to do that. Dave tried the device in the swimming pool at Mount Carmel, and then told Gordon that instead of slinging his light around his neck, he would just occasionally set it out to the side. Don and Dave told the dive team that if either of them didn't make it, no one should try to recover them. When the time for the body retrieval came, Dave dropped quickly, following the shot line down. He hit the bottom in just around 11 minutes, faster than he had planned, and immediately started swimming along the cave line. As soon as he saw Dion's body, he pulled out the body bag. Then he knelt alongside Dion and went to work. Even though he was breathing a mix of air that would reduce the effects of nitrogen narcosis, at such depths, Dave was probably still starting to feel intoxicated, one of the prime symptoms of nitrogen narcosis. He had been at the bottom of Bushman's Hole at about 886 feet for just over a minute. Thirteen minutes after Dave submerged, 
Don got the go signal from the surface marshal and dropped toward his meeting point with Dave at 725 feet. Approaching 500 feet, he looked down and the water was so clear that he could see Dave's light almost 400 feet below him. There was only one problem. The light wasn't moving. Don knew instantly that something had gone very wrong. By this time, more than 20 minutes into his dive, Dave should have been ascending. Don should have seen bubbles coming up as Dave vented the expanding gases in his rebreather and dry suit, but there was no movement. Don descended past the original meeting point in order to try to reach Dave. At about 800 feet, deeper than he had ever been, Don heard the slight, sharp crack of enormous pressure crushing something. His hammerhead CCR broke due to excessive pressure. Without it, Don would have to constantly monitor the oxygen levels in his rebreather and inject oxygen into his breathing loop manually. Don was certain that if he went down to Dave, he would join him forever. He got his rebreather back under control and started back up the shot line. 29 minutes after Dave had gone under, and about 6 minutes after Don had seen that his light was not moving, two support divers started their planned dive to meet up with Dave at 492 feet. As they closed on their target depth, they realized there were no lights coming up and no sign of Don or Dave. Their plan called for them to wait 2 to 4 minutes. They stayed for 6. On the way up, they passed two other support divers, including Peter Herbst, who were on their way down. Upon written slate communication with the ascending divers that something was wrong, Peter decided to descend past his target of 275 feet. Don was one of his best friends, and he wanted to help him if he could. Just past 400 feet, Peter spotted Don. Don asked Peter for a slate. Don scribbled, Dave not coming back on it. The slate was eventually passed to the surface by the support divers. Don continued his slow ascent. As Don approached about 164 feet, he started feeling faint. The cave started to spin around him. He didn't know it yet, but a small bubble of helium had formed in his left inner ear, causing extreme vertigo. He saw a flash of white go by, and then again. It was the shot line, and without thinking, he thrust out his hand to grab it. Don painfully continued his decompression stops. When he was close to the surface, he was unable to finish the last of his decompression stops and was carried out of the cave. He had been in Bushman's Hole almost 12 and a half hours. Within 22 minutes, he was in the recompression chamber. A few days later, when the dive team was retrieving their equipment, both the bodies of Dion and Dave came up as they were pulling up the shot line. The bodies were tangled in the line. Peter realized that Dave's light must have gotten tangled in the line, causing his demise. As Dave was pulled up, the gases in his body, as well as those in his suit, had started to expand, causing him to float and take Dion's body with him. Dave had died doing it, but Dion's body was finally recovered from Bushman's Hole. Don surely survived. He emerged from the recompression chamber at Bushman's after seven hours, disoriented and hardly able to stand. Over the next two weeks, he endured ten more chamber sessions, for a total of 27 hours of treatment. It was more than a month before he could think clearly or walk down a crowded street without his perception and balance running amok. Don was reportedly left with permanent damage that has impaired his balance, but he still continues to dive. The footage on the helmet camera allowed the divers to analyze Dave's final moments. Dave had run into difficulties when Dion's body unexpectedly began to float. Dave had previously been advised by various experts that the body would remain negatively buoyant because the visible parts were reduced to the skeleton. However, within his dry suit, Dion's body had turned into a soap-like substance called adipocere, which floats. Dave had been working with both hands, and so had been resting his light on the cave floor. 
The powerful lights that cave divers use are connected by wires to heavy battery canisters, normally worn on the cave diver's waist, or sometimes attached to their tanks. Normally Dave would have wrapped the wire behind his neck, but he was unable to do so with the camera helmet on his head. The lines from the body became entangled with the light, and the physical effort of trying to free himself led to his death. Dave's death was concluded to be the result of elevated CO2. With elevated breathing gas density and overexertion as contributing factors. So, Dave had passed out from carbon dioxide buildup and eventually drowned. A man, Nuno Gomes, is reported to be the last person alive today who knows what it's like to dive to the bottom of Bushman's Hole. And he understands why Dave had trouble reacting to a body that was suddenly floating instead of anchored. He said, you don't think of a new plan while you are down there. It doesn't work. Your mind is clouded. You cannot do it. But Nuno also wonders whether Dave should have done more build-up dives to increase his tolerance for narcosis. When he started putting the body in the bag and it didn't work, he should have immediately turned around and left, Nuno said. Presumably, Dave's mind was too clouded to make that decision.